Hello and welcome to Diversity in STEM, a panel discussion from Blue Dot on representation in the world of STEM. Now STEM, that's science, technology, engineering and maths. This panel discussion is part of Blue Dot's A Weekend in Outer Space, featuring live broadcasts from the world of science, music and culture from Blue Dot. Uh, of course, you can find out more, watch and listen to the rest of the weekend's activities at a weekend in outer space dot com. So that's all, all one word, a weekend in outer space dot com. So I'm Professor Jamal Khalili. I'm a physicist at the University of Surrey and, and a regular attendee and speaker at Blue Dot. So it's a shame that we can't all be there physically this year, but hopefully, hopefully we'll be back next year. Joining me on, on this discussion in this event are the science journalist Angela Saini and the astronomer and research fellow at the University of Manchester, Dr. Tana Joseph. They're each going to say a little bit about their work, but let me give you a bit more of an introduction about who they are first. So Angela Saini is an award-winning British science journalist and broadcaster. She presents science programmes on the BBC and her writing has appeared in New Scientist, The Sunday Times, National Geographic and Wired magazine. Her latest book, Superior, the Return of Race Science was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and named a Book of the Year by The Telegraph, Nature and the Financial Times. Her previous book, Inferior, How Science Got Women Wrong, which I have to say is absolutely brilliant. I loved reading it. Uh, it's been translated into 13 languages already. And Angela has a Master's in Engineering from the University of Oxford and was a Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Right, well, Tana, Dr. Tana Joseph is a South African astronomer currently living in Manchester. Her area of research is high energy binary stars outside of our galaxy. After completing her PhD at the University of Southampton in 2013, she returned to South Africa to pursue her postdoctoral research in Cape Town. She's also held both a Fulbright and Royal Society Research Fellowship. In addition to her research, she's passionate about science communication, as well as equality, diversity and inclusion efforts in academia. In 2018, she launched her own STEM communications company, Astrocoms. Tana and Angela, welcome to you both. Um, and I think, uh, Tana, you, we'll let you go first and say a little bit more about yourself and your work. So over to you. Hello, everyone. Hello, panel. Um... Yeah, panel members and listeners, thank you so much for having me. My name is Tana Joseph and I am a South African living here in North England. Um, with the current view outside my window, I sometimes wonder why, because it's very grey um, here in Manchester, but I do love the city. So, yeah, very sad that Blue Dot can't go ahead as usual, because it is really one of the um, highlights in the science calendar for me but I'm glad that I do have this opportunity to at least participate virtually. So what brings me here today, I was asked to be on this panel uh, for various reasons, and one of them is uh, being a black astronomer, uh, being an African astronomer, a woman in astronomy, and also having worked in the diversity and inclusion um, sort of sector as it pertains to academia, and lately, due to the movements uh, happening and the, the zeitgeist and conversations happening all over the world uh, when it comes to Black Lives Matter and so on, uh, there's a lot to be said and a lot of people are now listening, which is great, so you want to capitalize on that. Uh, one thing I always say, though, when I give these talks, and I've given a lot in the last month or so, is that I am not a trained diversity and inclusion person. I am not a scholar of decolonization or EDI efforts, or in South Africa we call that transformation. I am an astronomer, but I have been asked to talk more about um, equity, diversity and inclusion, or whatever you call it in your neck of the woods, than I've been asked to talk about my science, which is a pity, and I think that's um, kind of illustrates the problem that we have in that um, and, and an issue in academia is um, as well, where there's this uh, lack of diversity. So there are very few people you can call on, and you have to you find yourself suddenly talking about things that really aren't in your area of expertise. 
but you give it a good go because someone needs to say it. And like I said, there are so few of us. And in the UK at the moment, there are only five black PhD astronomers in the entire country, and none of us is British. Uh, one is American, and the rest of us are all African. So that's maybe something we can explore further um, in this discussion panel, but it's, that's the, the facts on the ground um, right now. Great. Thanks, Tana. Angela, over to you. Um, so it's such a pleasure to be here and especially sharing a panel with Jim and with Tana, who I respect so much. Um, so my, uh, I'm a journalist. Again, like Tana, I'm not a diversity or equity expert, although I'm frequently asked by universities to comment on these things. And I would urge people that if you want answers around diversity, then there are people who work specifically in this field and you can reach out to them. Um, they are professionals and they know what they're talking about on these issues. Um, but... In a similar way, I mean, I studied engineering at university. The reason I got into science reporting was because I was one of the co-chairs of the anti-racism committee at um, uni. And the, one of the reasons I did that was because I grew up in quite a racist part of London. And um, so that was the background to my childhood. Um, and that's how I started writing. And if I hadn't, if that hadn't happened, I think I'd be an engineer now rather than a journalist who's written a book about race science. Um, it is circumstance and politics, I think, that pushes us into having to speak about these issues. Um, and I think many of us who are minorities in our fields feel we have to. We don't have a choice. Um, and it is important, I guess, that we do as well, because who else is going to do it? <laughs> you know, we have to talk about our experiences. Um, from my perspective as a journalist, I've approached this um, a number of ways. One is looking at the ways in which racism still lingers uh, in the sciences and engineering and medicine, which it does, sometimes in very subtle ways, um, but also looking at the phenomenon of um, with the rise of the alt-right and the far-right ethnic nationalism around the world, um, how uh, spurious pseudoscientific um, claims about racial differences are starting to make a comeback, um, not only online, but also sometimes in mainstream politics and mainstream discourse. And some of these people are trying to gain a foothold again with very outdated ideas into mainstream academia. Um, so I think there's there's two ways of looking at this. One is uh, kind of the political threat, but also the kind of more subtle, sometimes not easy to recognize ways in which race persists in modern day science. Thank you, Angela. Um, okay, well, I think there's so much we can talk about. Um, and, and when we talk about diversity, of course, that means lots of different things. Tana, can I just come to you first? Because something that struck me, what you said there, um, you're an astronomer, right? You're, you're doing exciting research in astronomy. And when you get a, a, a platform, like speaking at a, a Blue Dot Festival, albeit uh, via Zoom virtually, presumably you really want to talk about your research. But at the same time, you know, as you said, you know, we're living in these, in these times where we feel we, you know, that moment has to be seized. You know, while it's being talked about and certainly the black lives matter movement how do you feel when when asked i mean is it is it a case of yes this is at the moment this is more important i have to talk about diversity i have to talk about lingering racism uh, my, my research can wait or do you feel oh, this is still an issue you know i wish i could i wish it wasn't that i could just talk about my science uh little column a little column b there jim um, I, so I've had all these um, opportunities to speak, like I said, in the last month, and there's very much the sense in me that, you know, we have to strike while the iron is hot, while we have the world's attention. And what I like about what's happening now is that it's filtering down to all segments of society. Um, so uh, people are talking about, you know, institutionalized racism at the level of, um, police, uh, you know, what's happening in police services, what's happening in government, um, immigration policies, all that kind of thing. But then filtering right down to the ivory tower, to academia, 
And that's never really happened before. So um, my background uh, coming from South Africa, from Cape Town, the University of Cape Town, had uh, these movements. We call them the fallist movements. And um, Roads Must Fall uh, kind of took hold a bit here in the UK um, uh, when there were issues about, like, you know, should Cecil John Rhodes statues be up? So the statue thing isn't even new. Um, but when the fallist movements were happening in South Africa, so there was Roads Must Fall, and then there was also Fees Must Fall because... The fees that, um, that universities charge in South Africa make university education very inaccessible to the majority of South Africans. So, but those were very isolated. They were very valid and they absolutely fit into what is happening now. But we were fighting on our own. And now I feel like everyone is, we're all together in this. There's a lot of attention on it. And everyone is pulling in in the same general direction, which is great. So that's the that's the other part of it. We are like, I would love to be talking about my X-ray binary research. I would love to be talking about this new data set that we have with the world's best radio telescope um, that's in South Africa. But I also need to seize the moment. And so what's happening in the background is I'm giving all these um, talks uh, about diversity and inclusion, about decolonization, about transformation, um, in astronomy specifically, but I'm also actually doing my research in the background. So that the research is still happening. Um, I'm just not having the opportunity to talk about it at the moment. And I hope that in future that will, uh, I, won't, well, I don't want to say I hope the situation will change because uh, we need to keep talking about all these other social issues, but that I will also alongside that maybe give me two talks. That would solve the problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, that would absolutely solve the problem. So perhaps I should start negotiating for that. I think that's right. You say, if you want me to talk about diversity and inclusion, I also want to talk about my, my, my work. Um, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I visited um, Cape Town actually for the first time late last year. And, you know, yes, there, there are still huge issues of society in, in, in South Africa that are having to be dealt with. There, there's obvious, you know, when you when you see an, in America a, um, a police officer giving the Ku Klux Klan sign to, to to people, you know, there's there's you know, it's so in your face racism that you know you, it's not hiding anywhere. But Angela, you you, you know, you talked about you know, lingering racism within science, within academia. H how does that manifest? You know, we like to think that as as academics, as scientists, we're liberal and enlightened, and of course we wouldn't possibly. You know, there wouldn't be any racism, even, you know, look inside me, I'm not at all racist. What sort of examples are there that it's still it's still there at a deep level? I think we have to understand um, when we look at the origins of modern Western science, here is an establishment that was built on certain assumptions. And one of those assumptions from the Enlightenment was that... Um, race existed so that humans could be categorized in a certain way and that there was also a hierarchy between these races. So some of the very first Enlightenment thinkers and naturalists started to devise these categories. They don't exist in nature. We are one human species. So they these are, these are social constructs. Um, and some of them thought there are a few races. Some of them thought there are many races. Um, this kind of color coding that we've landed on now is as arbitrary as anything else. You know, it doesn't, when you, it doesn't map onto human difference biologically in an, in any meaningful way. Um, but it was informed by the politics of the time, by the politics of slavery and of colonialism. And the belief on the part of these European scientists was that they represented the peak of Western civilization, of, of global civilization, that they were more advanced than anybody else. And within that hierarchy was also a gender hierarchy. Women were thought to be less uh, advanced in the 19th century there were, this was framed even that women were less evolved than men um, and this is one reason why for example European universities by and large um, excluded women all the scientific academies of Europe excluded women as a matter of course until the middle of the 20th century and the reason for that was that women weren't seen as capable of doing that intellectual work in the same way that other races weren't seen as intellectual equals of Europeans and that became the basis of the science of human difference so in the 19th century for instance you have people serious scientists and doctors in Europe and the US investigating the possibility as to whether 
um, black people don't feel pain in the same way that white people do, that their skin is thicker, that their bones are denser. These claims about um, certain races being closer to Neanderthals or to apes, to primates and than other races. Um, and this was all serious. So we think of race science now, of course, as pseudoscientific, but for the majority of scientific history, even well into the 20th century, it was just science. It was just mainstream science, the way that people thought about human dif difference. And in fact, there is good evidence that shows that even after the Second World War, which is when things started to change, attitudes started to change, there were still scientists then, mainstream, respectable people at universities like Oxford, who weren't entirely convinced that we were one human species, who still thought that maybe we were s separate subspecies. So that way of thinking however much we think it may have been purged from science, lingers because it was always the bedrock of the science of human difference. Um, and, it, and it manifests in very strange ways now. For example, in the coronavirus pandemic, we've just seen, um, I was astounded to see mainstream medical scientists, um, leading medical researchers and doctors speculate as to whether the, the racial disparities we've seen in health outcomes are down to genetics. That is actually impossible. It is not possible for that to be the case. And it also ignores the fact that there have always been racial disparities in health. You know, black Americans die of almost everything at higher rates than white Americans, including infant mortality. Black Americans have a lower life expectancy than white Americans for social reasons, in the same way that in the UK we see life expectancy gaps between the rich and the poor, which have actually been increasing in recent years. So rather than looking at the social determinants of health, which we should be doing, there are so many scientists, even now, to this day, who look to genetics or some kind of innate difference between these socially defined groups? I mean, you, you, you will also now hear it said that uh, if we have gone beyond, you know, f f for those you know, working, say, in academia who understand that, uh, you know, your, your ability to do, say, research in astronomy doesn't, doesn't depend on your gender, it doesn't depend on the colour of your skin, it, you know, you can do astronomy. This, the, and therefore, career progression, career opportunities, they will, I mean, I, I, I've got my arguments against this, but it's, I, I want to hear what you have to say. They will say, look, it should just be down to who is best for a particular job. You know, it isn't. It isn't. Uh, it isn't about you know positive discrimination or redressing balance. It should just be down. You know, what do you say to that? The people who think that uh, uh, we we shouldn't be pushing for diversity, uh, whether it's race, gender, cultural background, um, economic background. It should just be the best person for the job. Ah, uh, the the idea that academia is a meritocracy is literally laughable. I can never say it without actually laughing. And it is, I'll be polite and say if, if you are someone who genuinely believes that academia is a meritocracy and the people who advance in academia do so purely because they are the best person for their job, then you are very naive um, and probably very privileged and not aware of or or just unwilling to engage with what is actually happening around you. And so unfortunately, so we have to be careful how we say this. So Jim, so you said it really nicely. It, it's your your gender, race, um, socioeconomic background, uh, whether you're religious or not, et cetera, shouldn't have an impact on whether you can do science or go to university or walk on the moon. But it but at the end of the day, it does, and um, Andrew has already mentioned this idea of a social construct. Just because something is a social construct doesn't mean it doesn't have real-world impact. So race is a nonsense social construct, but it has real-world Im impact in terms of your educational attainment, your access to health care, um, how much money you make, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and one thing to also always remember about academia is that it's a microcosm of wider society. It is not the separate thing where, especially with science academia, people outside of science academia have this idea that scientists are automatons and we don't have feelings and we just, we are collectors of facts. We collect facts, like some people collect stamps. 
and that's absolutely not how science works. It's not how scientists work. So whatever oppressive structures exist in wider society, they also are at play in academia. So if it's if it's um, gender based violence, if it's um, racially charged racially charged in inverted commas atmospheres, etc., that all absolutely happens in um, in the academy and that impacts who ends up being a professor and who doesn't. Angela, do you want to add to that? Well, yeah, I think Tana's absolutely right, that you only have to look at the demographics to know that this isn't a fair system. And in fact, I think science sometimes lags behind the rest of the society when it comes to diversity. And one of the reasons for this is that uh, sad to say, but I promise you as a journalist, I've interviewed enough scientists and I've seen this attitude. Scientists too often mistake their bias for fact. They think of their own prejudices as not being prejudices at all, that they're just too wise or too clever to, to have these personal biases. And that, you know, in if the rest of society doesn't agree with you, then the rest of society is wrong because the scientists are just too smart. I mean, if you look at the fact, for example, that the Royal Society didn't admit women as members until 1945. So this is many decades after women started getting the vote. Um, it just goes to show that science is not leading the way here. <laughs> science is not the one kind of shining a beacon of universality and, you know, leading the way in terms of diversity or equity. And this is why I think even to this day, some of the most demographically skewed industries that we have out there are in the sciences in things like maths and physics. I mean, do you think it's because, as you say, that many in the sciences who feel there isn't a problem they, they, yeah, I mean, as Tana says, because they come from a privileged position, because they haven't had to deal with it, they don't see it. It may not be actually insidious that they, they, try, they have thoughts and views that are unpleasant, that, are, that may be misogynist or racist, but they, it's, they simply feel that they are rational in everything they do and, ev and and the way they think. Therefore, it can't possibly be the case that they are discriminating against any minority group. Is, is it that, that, that is the arrogance of science as being so rational? It can't possibly... I, I guess I'm sort of repeating what you've, what you've just said. Well, well, I think you're right that one of the problems with science is that we set it up as this kind of uniquely objective endeavour, as though it sits completely outside politics and society. And I still see scientists today claim that science is completely apolitical, forgetting, of course, that for hundreds of years it was deeply rooted in politics. To imagine now that it isn't, that somehow some break was made, I, d I don't know at what point they imagine that break happened, but at some point a break was made, and however irrational scientists were in the past or pseudo scientific they can't possibly be that way now we still live in a racist society and as long as we do then scientists will still be racist because they're as human as um as anybody else so that it is like tana was saying it is it's it's kind of bizarre that we um we don't we we kind of have we hold science up as something which it is not the goal of objectivity is i think a brilliant one, and this is one of the reasons I love science, why I studied engineering, but it is a goal because as humans we have bias and the only way we achieve objectivity is by taking into account our prejudices, accounting for our biases. Now if you don't even recognise that you have them, then I can promise you, you are perpetuating those mistakes. Tana, what, why, I mean, even let's say in a, in a, in a, utopian society where we you know there aren't these issues uh, and, and, and biases why would you say it's still important to have diversity and representation within say science you know as, as Angela says you know surely science is all about objectively seeking knowledge and, and collecting facts um, why would it be good for science to have different perspectives. Diversity in the workplace has been shown to improve productivity and innovation. I know a company like McKinsey, so this is the business case for diversity and they've actually done the business case for diversity and they found that more diverse teams just do better. They work better, they're more productive. So if you want to look at it from a purely economical capitalist point of view, it is a, it is a good 
diversity is a good because it means increased productivity. So from that point of view, and then also just the idea that people who have different lived experiences are going to tackle problems in different ways. They're going to come at things um, yeah, from different angles or even just ask different kinds of questions. And once you have that, once you throw that into the mix, that's where innovation happens. That's where breakthroughs happen. And I think that's uh, yeah, that's really important. It's because if you're the same kind of person, then you, if you yeah, if your workplace is just full of the same kind of person, you're only going to ask the same kind of questions and solve the problems in the same kind of way. And that's also what's um, I think um, slight misunderstanding both by scientists and by non-scientists about the scientific method. What the scientific method is? It's a it's a series of techniques, and you absolutely cannot stray from that in any way, shape, or form. And that is, yeah, that's not how science is really done. Sometimes, well, you have to make mistakes. Most of the time we're making mistakes and, and sometimes you have questions that don't have answers and you have to wait 50 years to get an answer because technology has to catch up. So you need to, yeah, so there's all these things to consider as well about where the power is, who's asking the questions, who's allowed to do science. And it comes back to this idea of science being political. And I've said that in every talk I've given over the last month, that science is political. The fact that we have something like the Royal Society, it was set up because the royals wanted this thing to happen. And they had you had to have endorsement literally from a monarch to be able to carry out this kind of work. And you had to be in favor with the right people. Um, and a modern example is the Square Kilometer in South Africa, where we countries had to bid as if they were on a talent show, a TV talent show. They had to bid to be the host of this telescope. It didn't. It wasn't about who had the most technology or who had the most um, number of um, astronomers. It was about who had the most political clout and the most money to throw at the problem at the time, and who could put on the best song and dance so that all this money could come for this telescope to this country. And South Africa, had we, we had a fantastic bid. We ran a flawless race when it came to that, and we beat, out, uh, we beat out several other countries, and it came down to politics. It came down to the fact that we had support from our president and the Minister of Science for South Africa, so from the highest levels of, um, of the body politic all the way down to the scientists, and that's what really won it for us in the end. So there's... As long as, as long as you have people and you have money, you have politics, and those three, those three things are always at play in science. Absolutely. A Angela, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I, it still surprises me that scientists, <laughs> scientists think or still claim that science is apolitical. It was rooted in this. I mean, if you look back through the history, I mean, I'm just talking about Western science here. Of course, there are so many other scientific systems and different ways of doing things around the world. But Western European science had quotas for hundreds of years, and those quotas were 100% male and almost exclusively white. And it's and now when I hear scientists saying, oh, by increasing diversity, you're reducing meritocracy or you're damaging the ability of science to perform at the same level. I just say to myself, that is bizarre because you have done that for all those hundreds of years by denying the talents of all these millions, if not billions of people. You know, what all we're doing now is redressing that balance finally, and science can only benefit from that. The only reason you would think that that's not possible is if you really do believe in these stereotypes. If you really do believe that women and minorities aren't as good at this, that's the only possible justification for not wanting diversity in the workplace. So let's, let's talk about women's representation in, in, in science. In particular, I'm thinking of, you know, sort of my, uh, you know, mine and, and, and Tana's uh, subjects. I'm a physicist, Tana's an astronomer. The physical sciences, of course, you know, and then you've got computer science, you've got engineering, where the, the, the fraction of, of, of young girls at school taking these subjects, going on to study them at university is, is still so small. And, and people will say, oh, well, it's just, you know, physics is just a boy subject, you know, sort of something that society is ingrained in science, nothing we can do about it. You know, how, how is that imbalance addressed? And of course, as you said, Angela, it's, it's, it's not about uh, trying to make sure there's 50-50 representation of, of it's it's about saying here's half the population and 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 <laughs> look at all that that potential that you're cutting off but you know we've been worrying about increasing the represent representation the visibility the the the, the role models of, of women in subjects like physics and astronomy for many years 
Yeah, do you know what's weird about this is that it's a particularly European problem, an American problem. So some of the worst rates of women in certain subjects that you see in the sciences are in Europe. And some people look at that and say, how is that possible? These are some of the most gender equal countries on earth. How is it possible? And it comes down to culture. Because like I said, the roots of European Enlightenment scientific culture were sexist and racist to begin with. So, for example, if you go to the Middle East or if you go to parts of Asia, they don't have these same hang-ups, which is why you get so many wonderful um, Arab scientists like Mariam Mirzakhani, who was the first woman to win a Fields Medal. So she was Iranian-American. And I don't think that's any surprise. I meet so many Iranian women scientists and engineers because that same I mean although there are of course there are Iran is still a patriarchal society but that cultural idea that women can't do science doesn't exist in the same way that it does in Europe and where I come where my family come from India so my dad was an engineer and I, and I thought well if he can be an engineer then I can be an engineer and there are many women engineers and doctors that I, and scientists that I meet in India as well so we have to remember that there is culture at play here. The reason that people do the things they do is heavily influenced by the stereotypes of the society that they're in. And sometimes that can sit at odds with how gender equal the society is in other ways. So a society can be very patriarchal in lots of ways, but still be quite good when it comes to encouraging women in science. And in fact, some of the highest rates of women researchers you see are in South America. Mm. Yes, it is interesting. Not, um, my research in nuclear physics, I've got a lot of collaborators from Southern Europe. Uh, and uh, I've got uh, women uh, that I work with in in Lisbon in Portugal, and there you know they outnumber the men in the in the nuclear physics research group. Whereas in the UK, you know, there's, I I know two or three women within the whole of the UK universities in, in nuclear physics um, group, group. So it is it is strange, but um, I mean, we uh, you mentioned in uh, the Middle East. I mean, we we it was only this this week there was the the uh, uh, the, the launch of that uh, the, the uh, uh, Mars. Uh, probe from the Emirates uh, and there was a lot of talk in fact I, I for the first time I was invited onto woman's hour to, to uh, <laughs> and my wife was very worried I was going to I was going to say something wrong <laughs> um, but, but, to, but, but what was wonderful there was that 80% of the science the scientists involved in that space mission in the Emirates were women as you say, the Emirates and the Gulf states is still a very conservative, patriarchal society. That seems to be, it doesn't seem to reflect in whether or not these subjects are appropriate subjects for women. I mean, Tana, you've, you know, as an astronomer, do you know, is, is there a reason why there are so many more women going into subjects like physics in, in um, state like, states like the Emirates? Uh, is it because it's not seen as a, as a as a male subject? I think well, from my from my understanding, and I haven't done that. This is all based on sort of anecd anecdata. That, is that a new word? Did you did you make up? <laughs> yeah, that, I love that. that. <laughs> no, it's it's going around um, in the Twitter sphere. Anecdata. I, I'm going. I'm just going to write it. Anecdata. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is um, because what we're doing is, and this has been touched on by both of you already, is that when we think about diversity and inclusion, we, we're often thinking about it through a very Europe, Western European lens. And so when we look at certain countries and we look at, say, South America, and we're like, oh, but there's all this machismo culture, or you look at um, Gulf states and you're like, oh, there's all this, like, you know, um, perhaps religious-based patriarchal culture. But we're looking at it through, yeah, through this Western European lens where to us the patriarchy means that women are very emotional and so they can't do logical stuff, and so therefore they must hold a crying baby rather than a spanner. Whereas in these other cultures, they're like, well, like, you know, um, putting a woman somewhere in a room with a lot of fat, like, you know, with a lot of numbers to add up, that's, that's the right job for, for a lady. You, you are out of the public eye, and you sit there, and you're quiet, and it keeps you busy and out of trouble. And so if you look at it from a different point of view, that's a very good job for a woman to have, and a very useful skill um, that you can take out into, you know, other other aspects of your life and other aspects of society. So it, it's, we must always be mindful of, you know, our, again, our own biases. How are we looking at, um, how we, are we looking at this and that uh, patriarchal doesn't necessarily mean um, locking women out of STEM, but it might mean that, you know, there are other constraints. And one other thing I will say is that 
having studied and worked both in well in South Africa, the US and the UK, is the different approaches to this because now we're, we're siloing um, racism away from sexism, etc. And I'm a black woman, so I'm not, I'm, I'm all of these things all of the time and I don't get to choose which one I am at any given moment. So these things all affect me and they affect me in tandem. And so it's, um, and it's not a linear superposition necessarily of those two things. So one thing I will, so in South Africa, we are very focused on transformation. So transformation is what we call diversity and inclusion. And it's entirely based on race with a little bit of gender, whereas the UK is the exact opposite. Uh, when I started my PhD in 2009, I, um, I w- was at the University of Southampton, and there it was, I had a fantastic time there, and the, but the focus when it came to diversity was just, in, I don't even think they were calling it diversity, it was just women in STEM, women in STEM, women in STEM. And it's only now over the past year or two since I've been back in Manchester that um, that we're starting to talk about black, Asian, and minority ethnic um, aspects to diversity and inclusion as well. In the U.S., um, they're a bit further ahead on this, and they're much more open to and knowledgeable of um, intersectionality. So when we talk about all these efforts, when we talk about um, Black Lives Matter, for instance, there's immediately the chorus from those of us who are black and also embody other marginalized identities to say, all black lives matter. Um, so disabled black lives matter, uh, female black lives matter, transgender black lives matter, LGBT black lives matter, uh, all of these different, like, you know, poor black lives matter. It's not just a one dimensional thing. And when we talk about women, we also need to account for for the, yeah, how, you know, how does racism play into the experience of being a woman? How does, how does being LGBT, how does being disabled play into all of these things as well? Um, so this, so we must, and this is the kind of thing that we must always have at the front of our minds when we are looking at patterns for why certain things appear to be working in some countries or in some regions and not others, because there's probably some underlying um, biases at play as well. Yeah, um, Angela. What I mean, what then is the next step? I mean, I, I mean, I, I know what the next step should be. People should read your books. Uh, people should listen to the passionate advocacy of people like Tana. But, but you know, if we want to really head, we can. Um, I, I suspect you know, human fallibility. We're ne- never going to achieve true true diversity across all these different um, uh, areas. But what are the next steps? What can what what are the most effective things we can start doing? Well, I think what Tana says is absolutely right. We need to think about this in a much more fine grained way. The way in which um, oppression and disadvantage can, of all different kinds, can coincide in one person. Um, so, for example, if you are very wealthy and you happen to be an ethnic minority, but you're very wealthy, you go to all the top schools. You're more likely to go to Oxbridge. But the fact is, in places like the US and the UK and in South Africa, race overlaps quite heavily with socioeconomic status. So it's actually sometimes socioeconomic status you also need to think about here. Um, It's not always um, as simple as it seems. I'll just give a quick example from um, when I was at school. So because I decided to study engineering, um, I went down the maths physics route. And because of that, I ended up being the only girl in a lot of my classes because um, many of the very bright girls um, wanted to do medicine. So they went down the biology chemistry route. And um, I didn't mind this. It was fine. Um, It didn't make it much difference to my life. But I remember one of the school governors, um, when he found out that I wanted to study engineering at university, he gave me a copy of Dorothy Hodgkin's biography to read and I was really confused at the time and it was actually only years later that I understood what he was trying to do what he wanted me to do is feel inspired by another woman in science what he didn't realize was the reason that I was doing engineering and the reason that I felt uh, any kind of pressure in my life was not because of my sex it was because I lived in a very white part of London me and my sisters were some of the few ethnic minorities we even saw in our town 
and racism was the big aspect of my life and I knew that my dad had been an engineer and I thought if a brown man like my dad can do this then I can do this so it was race that was driving my choices and affecting the way I was thinking and I think this is why we need to be careful you know when people say to me you know we'll get more women in these subjects if we just have more women role models I don't think that really captures all the complexity of it every every girl is in a different situation I think. Tana, do you agree? I mean, uh, I was going to actually ask how important it is to have to have uh, role models. Uh, but as Angela says, it's not always obvious. What What is your motives for going into a particular direction? I, I remember t- chatting, I chatted with Brian Cox some years ago, and we were talking about we're going to schools and giving talks. And, and a, t- a teacher would say, oh, yeah, because, of course, you're, you're great role models. Said, what, really? You know, is when, if Brian Cox goes and gives a talk, they look at this, this chat they see on TV, middle-aged man, talking about, is that the person? They think, I'm going to be him. No, you know, <laughs> and, and that's for the, for the boys and who are white. You know, what about people coming from so many other diverse backgrounds? So do you agree that role models, well, it, 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 it may be part of the solution, but it certainly isn't going to be the whole answer? Absolutely. This thing about people trying to simplify um, a complex problem and or trying to find an overly simple solution. And that's something that plagues diversity and inclusion efforts all over the globe in all different sectors. You, um, this thing about, oh, we'll just have role models. I grew up in post-apartheid South Africa. I was born during apartheid. Uh, most of my formative years were spent in just post-apartheid uh, South Africa. No science role models, none whatsoever. Um, so you look at me and you're like, oh, this is a black South African born during apartheid, like some kind of like miracle. And now I'm a, an astronomer. But actually, I come from a very middle class background. I uh, both my parents are home owning university graduates. Um, and yeah, and the massive support of my family, both my parents were high school science teachers. Um, so there's four of us. So we're four kids. And three of us are into science and there's one who studied politics and she's the, she's the rebel in the family. So when you look at my family history, you see a, yeah, you see a very standard middle class upbringing. Um, I went to, uh, my parents were able to send my siblings and I to formerly whites only schools. So the better schools, um, I, yeah, I don't have that. Uh, I, by the time I reached university, I was familiar with the university. I had lots of friends who came from my school to the university. Both my parents had gone. It was a very normal um, thing to, you know, to go to university. Uh, my parents had encouraged me from a young age to, um, you know, to be curious about the world and explain things to me. I decided that I wanted to be an astronomer at the age of 11. And so, and that's just from seeing Hubble legacy images. So no role models. But one thing I did have, and this is again why it's it's a very complex um, situation, you have to take each kind of case on its merit, is that what I did have, and the thing that's actually the biggest factor, at least in the UK where it's been studied, whether a young woman or girl will choose um, science A-levels or choose to go into science at tertiary level, is the, is parental support. And that is... Um, especially important if you come from a social background or a cultural background where family is very important, like I do. So basically, and then they, if you dig a little deeper, there's actually some evidence to suggest it's specifically whether your mother lets you or encourages you to do something. So I had a mother who was a life science uh, teacher at high school, and she has two university degrees, and she didn't go to university. Both my parents didn't go to university um, straight after high school, like I did what my dad did, but then he got caught up in politics and then he dropped out of his BSc and became a teacher, a physics and maths teacher. But I saw my parents go to university. So I grew up seeing them go and study. And my mother had two kids in that time as well. And they had a mortgage and they had their full-time jobs. So this was just one part of your life for me. And I think that, I think that that's a very important, when people ask me how, you know, how did you go on this journey? I'm like, well, because my parents let me and my parents encouraged me and they 
didn't allow anyone to try and waylay me, to try and talk me out of it. They were just like, well, no, my, in 1995, I decided I wanted to be an astronomer. My parents were like, that's perfect. That's what we're doing. And the whole family just got behind me. They don't always understand. So when I say my family, I mean my cousins, aunts and uncles. They're very proud of me. They know I'm a doctor. They don't 100% understand exactly um, what I'm doing. But the main reason I'm an astronomer today is because my family and in particular my parents um, had just, yeah, just provided me with unwavering, unblinking support for my academic achievements. And the same with my sisters. My middle sister is completing a PhD in chemistry and my brother wants to go into paleontology. And like I said, we have our little rebel. Uh, my sister just uh, finished her master's in politics. So ah. we were set up for this, despite yeah, yeah, what yeah, it looks yeah. like from the outside. <laughs> there was no underachieving that was going to be allowed in our <laughs> home. I mean, Angela, then you know, not everyone ha has has that, you know, the, the wonderful opportunity and, and family um, support mechanism that Tana has. Uh, and so more often than not, it's it's whether you have an inspiring teacher, you know, who uh, who will point you in the right direction, who, who, who gets you passionate. Um, very often it's it's you know career advice isn't appropriate and and you know what i i there are you know i'm, I'm going to use some anecdata here um i, I colleagues of mine senior women uh, in in physics professors of physics you know dames and so on, when you ask them about how they started off very often they'll say they went to an all-girls school so you know they a bit, bit so they they it never occurred to them that maths physics chemistry were were boy subjects it was just if if you enjoy this subject you do it you know is how important is it that we change attitudes at that level down you know primary school level you know it's interesting because i also you know as a feminist have gone back and forth on this idea of single sex schools because there are a lot of gender scholars who say that uh, you know if we're truly going to have an equitable society that we shouldn't have them but in the society that we live in in which sexism is real um, single sex schools do make a difference I see so many there are much higher rates of girls who go into the sciences and engineering from these single sex schools and that's because of the pressures you do face when you have boys in a classroom and teachers behave differently towards the boys and the girls there's no doubt about that so if you don't have that pressure it does make a difference there's no doubt um, I think a lot of this is about ambition what are the aspirations that we have for our kids so like Tana was saying she had aspirational parents I had aspirational parents um, what I find and I think this is a this is a socio-economic issue largely I went to a state school um, I you know, many of my, um, the town in which I lived was kind of working class, lower middle class. There were lots of bright kids, but a real lack of ambition, and not just among parents, but particularly among teachers, you know, in the state school that I was at, even though it was a grammar school, it was a selective school, but there was a real lack of ambition for what we could and couldn't do. Um, and that is a is the big problem here. I'm still outraged at the fact that, you know, when there are programs for inner city kids, especially ethnic minorities, um, you know, they're never to get them into the top universities. It's always about music and dance and sport and kind of low hanging fruit. You know, we don't expect much from these kids academically, but they can do these other things. That is not where we should be investing. We should be investing to make sure that all these children who are as capable as any other kids, can reach those heights that kids who go to private schools and public schools um, have the opportunity to do. We've got a few minutes left, so I do sort of want to sort of end on a more positive note. So, I mean, Tana, you're clearly uh, an example of a, of a success story, but can, can you think of where, you know, things are moving in the right direction that we can be encouraged by? Um, well, the numbers are slowly shifting. Uh, across the board in terms of female engagement in STEM and uh, going all the way through um, academia as well. But there's still, there's still some issues like uh, for, the, for the hard scientists, um, in inverted commas, for the physical sciences, there's still, like, you know, the lag is significant. Um, one of the success stories, I will say, is the um, involvement of Africans in astronomy with the advent of the SKA. And it's, the process is by no means perfect. Um, we're still working out. There's a lot of issues. We, we're carrying a lot of baggage from colonialism and apartheid, etc. Uh, but the the number of students who are coming through the system, uh, funded by SKA and affiliate programs, 
Um, it's been really heartening to see. And so when earlier when I said uh, the Square Kilometer Day was awarded to South Africa and Australia, we expanded it to the rest of Africa. So there, well, there are eight other African countries who are part of the SK Africa Consortium and seeing them come through the ranks. And I'll give a, a, a shout out to all of them. So the Ghanaians have the telescope up and running. Um, the Madagascans have been sending the students to us even before SKA. Um, so they have a pipeline that really seems to be working for them. Botswana is working on becoming a big data hub. Namibia is going to be the next big thing in multi-messenger. Uh, well, not multi, multi, certainly multi-waving, hopefully multi-messenger astronomy. And and so what else did I miss? Oh, Mauritius. Mauritius is doing, um, they're doing fantastic work as well, sending lots of students through um, working across the board from big data to um, radio astronomy. And then Kenya as well, also a big powerhouse coming into their own, building uh, building their telescope. So it's just been, and Zambia, Zambia's the other one, I can't leave them out. So and Zambians as well have been sending students through the South African pipeline um, even before SKA. So it's a concerted effort and it takes a long time to change things. It shouldn't take a century, which last time I checked was about how long it would take to get gender parity for the hard sciences in Europe or in the UK, if things carry on at the pace they are. But if we, if like, you know, if you crack on in the UK, you too can catch up with the Africans and, you know, <laughs> and follow our example because we're getting things done. And like I said, it's by no means perfect. We are, we are still being hamstrung by um, historical wrongs that need to be righted. But we are, but we are definitely showing the way, not just in terms of the cutting edge technology, but in terms of the kind of people who are now allowed to take part in this very hard, very technologically driven uh, kind of science. And that's been thrilling to see. Fantastic. Angela, what about you? Can you... Uh... Hit us with some more positives. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a lot of my work is kind of um, in the very dark corners of the internet where the white supremacists and the far right people hang out. Um, so it's, and you know, one of the narratives I still hear in these spaces, um, and, and, you know, I see this bleeding through sometimes even into mainstream politics, is these kind of white supremacist ideas that Europe is somehow the powerhouse of civilization that the you know these old 19th century ideas that only Europe and the Americas can ever be great because they're built on these um on a certain type of person that they you know we have different genetic qualities to everybody else but I think you know if you look right the way through history you see civilizations rise and fall nations rise and fall it has always happened and um these ideas that we have that you know that we have had for a couple of hundred years, that we have internalized the roots of slavery, the roots of colonialism, that somehow Europe is the best and the most advanced civilization are already being proven to be wrong by the fact that history is already changing. We're seeing, as Tana says, the rise of Africa, the rise of China, the rise of the Middle East. And this is where the future lies now. Um, and we have to accept this. this. This is what happens. This is how history works. Um, so if we we can either do it in a kind of pluralistic globalist way and be open-minded about this and work together or we can do it in the way that people did in the past which is like look on and retreat into themselves and fail to understand what's actually happening um, I would love it what I want for the future is is and it's a very old-fashioned idea but this sense of humanism and universalism back again um, that we are all the same underneath you know you are told it when you're a kid that <laughs> race is just about what's on the surface we're all the same underneath that is literally true when you look at the genetics and the biology of it and um, if we want to build a future that is sustainable um, in which that is fairer that takes into account the mistakes that have been made in the past, then we all have to work together, I think. And um, I don't see that happening right now, but I really hope that we get there one day. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is hard sometimes to, to, you know, particularly today when we see so much polarisation in societies and, and uh, un unpleasant um, leadership, <laughs> uh, uh, polarisation of views on social media, you know, we, we're ending on a positive note that we can see, hopefully, we know the direction to go, but I think we shouldn't kid ourselves that there's still a, a, a long journey ahead. 
I hope you've both enjoyed this 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 session. Thank you both very much for your, for your time. It's been a fascinating discussion, and and you know, I'm sure you've both got so much more you could be saying. Um, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll draw it to a, to a close. And um, well, Tana, you're based in Manchester, so hopefully you're going to be at Blue Dot next year, right? So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. Uh, Andrew and I hopefully will try and make it. I, you know, I, I was very sad not to that it didn't happen this year. I've been for the last two or three years. Um, and so, and thank you everyone for tuning in at home and um, listening to this event. So, of course, we should say that Blue Dot fingers crossed, returns physically to, to Jodrell Bank in, in, in Cheshire. That'll be on the 22nd to the 25th of July, 2021. Already confirmed are Bjork, Groove Armada and Metronomy. Uh, I've never heard of, are Metronomy good? Are they like a, a beat <laughs> combo? I, I've heard of Bjork and I've heard of Groove Armada, uh, but I'm, I'm an old git. <laughs> 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 uh, so of course anyone if you'd like more information on the Blue Dot Festival and Blue Dot's universe of music science and cosmic culture then please visit discovertheblue.com uh, thank you Angela thank you Tana um, thank you everyone for listening bye bye bye